as long um, as if you everybody can. could, excuse me, if everybody could go ahead and mute their phones. Um, that way we can make sure that the presenters can be heard and there's no background noises. Um, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box or you could raise your hand also um, available on the controls on your screen. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of this presentation. Um, before we start the actual webinar, I'd like to have the Pulp and Paper Manufacturers Association Exec Executive Director Dick Kendall uh, talk a little bit about the webinar and then explain some things we'll discuss at the end of the session. So I'm going to turn it over to Dick Kendall. Thank you, Elise. And uh, Elise, you can hear me, yes? Yes. All right. And if you can, I'm assuming everybody else can. And I welcome everybody today to this webinar. This is a free webinar sponsored by the Pulp and Paper Manufacturers Association. The voice you were hearing is that of Elise Hitchcock, and she is the brains behind the mechanics here today, and I thank her for her participation. The Pulp and Paper Manufacturers Association, the association that I am executive director for, has been providing human resource services to the paper industry, to converting operations, and to allied industries since 1936. And uh, we've continued to uh, look at what we offer our members, and I'm just glad that everybody, member or non-member, has tuned in this morning to today's webinar. As far as the mechanics of this session, uh, Elise covered a few, uh, and that is the idea that we're going to hear in a moment from an expert who I'll introduce to you. Uh, he'll be talking about today's topic. Uh, we will have some time for questions and answers at the end. And then we're going to kind of have, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, what is the point of today's session, and what does it point to in terms of the future, and how you folks that are listening in today might take advantage of the things that you're hearing and I say take advantage uh, in a positive sense, not take advantage in a negative sense. I'm going to introduce our speaker today, and that uh, individual is Dr. Michael Kasurik. Mike and I have known each other for a long time. He's Professor Emeritus of Paper Science and Engineering uh, at North Carolina State University. He is recognized across the world, really, the globe in the pulp and paper industry. Uh, he's got a number of uh, focus areas that he's familiar with, uh, pulp and paper technology, liner board manufacture, tissue manufacture, paper properties, and he's certainly been involved in workforce and professional development. I think it's conservative to say that Mike has taught 300 uh, industry operators and professionals in over 50 different industry corporations. He's worked with and through government organizations, including the Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency and the American Forest and Paper Association, and many of you may know them. In addition to his teaching uh, undergraduate and graduate students since 1970. For 37 years or more, uh, Mike has taught the oldest and uh, most highly ranked short course on introduction to pulp and paper. He's done that through the past. <coughs> He's the editor of 11 books. He's uh, including the recognized pulp and paper manufacturer series. Uh, I could go on and on and tell you all kinds of other things about his Taffy Fellow Award and Distinguished Service Award, his induction into the Paper Industry International Hall of Fame, but if I spend much more time doing that, we won't have enough time for the presentation that he's looking to make. And that presentation today is this whole concept and idea of providing operator training to the workforce of the future. It's an important topic. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Kasurik, and you'll hear a little bit from me later on today. Mike, take it away. Mike, before you begin, let me just say one last thing, that, that this webinar is being conducted in accordance with the TAPI antitrust policy. So if you have any questions about that, just please let me know at any time. All right, Mike, it's all on you. All right. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everyone, um, unle unless, you're, uh, unless you're in Europe. Um, it's my pleasure to walk you through and be your host for this webinar. Uh, being a typical professor, however, uh, and this is one reason why faculty never get things done, I do have one correction about something Dick said. Um, this visual that you have in front of you shows two operators. I think over the last 40 years, I've taught somewhere between three to 5,000 operators, uh, rascals. Um, th 300, you're barely able to learn how to <laughs> chew tobacco and spit. It takes a long time to be able to communicate with these guys. But let's begin. I, I'm going to use this slide here to try to convey 
what we're what we're here for and what we're going to be talking about. I recognize that there are people here who have a variety of different experiences uh, and and different situations, and their companies who have different types of training. Um, many of you may be clearly at the level where you could give this this presentation because you've been doing this for so long. But I know from my own uh, visitations that there are many companies that are very definitely uh, searching for a way to improve and, and build upon what they now do or don't do. So with that in mind, uh, recognizing we do have a, a variety of different audience, let's just begin. I like this slide because it's showing uh, two operators uh, looking at the control screens for a, for a pretty significantly large uh, paper machine. And it has been said uh, by many that controlling uh, a paper machine, at, for example, compared, and of course we've got the pulp mill and other operations, but controlling a paper machine is a bit like flying uh, a 747 jet 200 feet off the ground. The, the gentleman on the right is a senior operator. Let's call him Joe. Joe's been there for 30 years. Joe was there before they had controls. Joe learned how to use these process control screens, but Joe's been out there. He made that machine work by turning valves, by getting a feel for the machine. He's also picked up over the years a lot of background information about why things happen. But even Joe, does not know all the things about what formation is. What is it that causes the product to be superior or does not? Joe is also going to be retiring in six months. So let's call him Jim on the left. He's a newer operator. Um, he's been through some of the mills training programs. And in this country, as we'll comment on, as you'll see, uh, in the U.S., we do emphasize both on the job training and mill training that describes the equipment, how it operates, what it does. But operators, Jim, does not have the knowledge of why things happen. So you see he's looking at something and he's thinking to himself, okay, I think that the reason I'm having that wet streak is due to a variety of different basic causes. No, I think I'll blame the pulp mill, which is traditional in our industry, in paper. But the point is, is that this is a newer employee. And the question is, does he know how much of the knowledge that is needed to operate effectively for this company and that equipment? Does he have all of the knowledge that's needed? And that's what we're going to be exploring today. So I think it's a very good example. Very good example. All right, well, let's, let's move on and, and, and begin. Industry has expressed concerns uh, for, for the last oh, 12 years or so about the fact that the workforce is aging and that we need to train this next generation of and knowledge from current workers. And it's been referred to by some of them as a retirement tsunami. But again, this is nothing new. Uh, retirements based on uh, talking and surveys conducted by, by TAPI, for example, indicate that there's at least 3,300 hourly workers a year that will need to be replaced in, a, in our industry. Uh, where will these people come from, and how do we need to train them? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Back in 2001, Agenda 2020 uh, created and held a summit to deal with a variety of technical issues, but also with the issue of how to create a, and the need to create a technologically advanced workforce to not only recruit the best and brightest, but to train and educate operators to run the mill of today and to continue to educate professional and hourly employees to run both the mill and the industry of tomorrow. So I think it's fair to say that <clears throat> companies in general have various combinations of, 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 of these. 
first of all, historically, we have always had on-the-job training. It's a traditional proven method, and people learn what needs to be done. And nothing can replace this. No matter what else companies do, what, uh, whatever their, their plan is, nothing can replace that experience. Uh, so that's, that's, that's integral. Then we have what I would call traditional training programs, and that does focus on what is needed to do the job. Uh, it includes not only startup, shutdown, safety, uh, how to operate, what happens. I have seen some, just in the last two weeks in the four mills I've been in, I have seen some amazing, amazing, beautiful training programs that if I talk about them, they're going to shoot me, so I can't. But just absolutely outstanding. Um, one, mill, one mill had the best I've seen in the way they laid it out. Uh, another mill in the last four weeks I've been in had minimal training, very minimal. I'll repeat, very minimal. The third category is edu what I call educational training. Uh, it's technology training, and that's done mostly around the world. Europe and, and the Pacific Rim has been doing this for years. The focus is on both what happens but why things happen as well. And only of the four companies I, I was visiting uh, the last, as I mentioned, two weeks, only one was doing this third level. Uh, and they've been doing it for about 11 years. Uh, it took a lot of effort on their part to put this information into their LMS system uh, to make it work. Very impressive what operators had access to. Um, another mill was using short courses as a way to try to bring the operators up to speed in technologically, again, not, not, uh, not the training, not the traditional training, but why things happen with the idea of then having and picking up with internal, internal uh, efforts. Um, now, so the goal is to create this technologically advanced workforce. I think that's something that the industry at this summit back in 2001 said is important for U.S. competitiveness. So it's to give operators knowledge of what's happening and why it's happening. And this says the rest of the world is already focused on that type of training. So paper makers know how to run their equipment. There, there is no question of that. Um, I was in my first mill as a student back in 1962, uh, fifth hand at Hammer Mill Paper Company in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so I, I've been in so many mills, you see, you learn that U.S. paper makers know how to run their equipment. They have a feel for everything. So why do we need this, this other hierarchy training? Well, first of all, retirements are going to require new employees to be brought up to speed faster. And up to speed means as much knowledge as they need to be able to run that machine at the sweet spot and understand variations in product quality. Increased competition around the world uh, certainly threatens uh, U.S. mills. We used to be the best in the world. And by best in the world, I mean in the United States, if we go back 20 years, there were two strategic industries that dominated the globe. The U.S. aerospace industry, led by Boeing, and the U.S. paper industry. Well, things have happened over the years that have brought us to where we are now. We always had the best and most productive equipment in the world, the best wood and fiber supply and quality, the best people, and the largest consumer base in the world. All right, so what, what's, what's happened? Well, looking at equipment, the equipment suppliers will put modern equipment anywhere in the world. This particular uh, came here digester uh, is modern and, and pretty looking too. Uh, that's located in South America. This paper machine, board machine, actually is, is in China. And the technology that went into building that and into training the operators went with that machine. 
this is a very interesting list. I hope you can um, you can read it if you if you're at full screen, uh, showing. And this was uh, right at the end of 2010. As of 2000, uh, beginning beginning in 2011, these were the world's fastest in paper board machines. Now, speed doesn't mean productivity. We all know there are other factors in here. But my point is, look at where these newest and fastest machines were being placed. If you go to that third column, you've got machine number and location for different grades. So Germany, Spain, Finland, Sweden, Canada, uh, Italy, um, Indonesia, China, Slovakia. And then we get some other grades. China, and you see Mexico. You see a wide number of countries. One country is missing. The suppliers, they have always held in, particularly for the U.S., it has been a partnership where the, the suppliers are the consultants to, to our mills. It's been that way since the 1960s when we went through this scientific renaissance in the late 50s and early 60s. And it's the suppliers that built their technical centers, developed new products, took this new knowledge that came out of this scientific renaissance and produced both chemicals, equipment, and services. Well, those are available around the world. And so we're, we're seeing that advantage that once really lay with the U.S. is now truly global. And what I'm doing is painting a foundation to, to kind of show where things are in the rest of the world compared to the U.S. and why there's such an interest in, in, in added training right now. Forests, well, when you look around the world at these different forests, um, you certainly do see a large forest mass in, in Brazil. A lot of that, of course, is, is, in, is, uh, is, is tropical wood. But nonetheless, Central America, Brazil, you look over at Indonesia, you can see that there is a tremendous effort, particularly with the plantations. Uh, you look at the U.S., we have, of course, the southeast uh, is, is, is the wood basket, the primary wood basket, but we've got a lot of forest land in, in, in the east, north, and northern U.S., and, of course, out on the west coast. Canada is another large uh, wood basket. The largest in the world, that's Russia. Uh, access has always been a, a question, uh, but we are seeing railroads being built now that will give greater access to that very large wood basket. And the fiber is good. It's good fiber. Uh, and mills and the industry has always gone and built wherever that fiber supply is. The other thing that's happening is while the United States, certainly per capita, uh, is, is a very large market for our mills productions, uh, we see and every, every piece of output from all the people who, who study this topic, we do see that in the developed economies, particularly in North America, uh, consumption has leveled off. Uh, people with, um, with um, additional monies to spend, uh, we're basically spending it on electronic media. It's having, it is having an impact. Certainly packaging is different, tissue is different, but the traditional printing and writing grades, uh, they're certainly in competition with the electronics. The point is, is that that's leveled off. But you come over to these developing economies and you can see that the, the rate of growth is much, is much higher. So, for example, in, in, in China, the per capita, per capita consumption is much, much lower. But with 10% of the population moving into the middle class, acquiring wealth, when you look at 10% of 1.2 billion people, that's 120 million more, more consumers. So in one way, that's good because the mills that they're building, they're going to need that output to supply their own people as opposed to, to any country exporting uh, surplus production. The point is, is that the United States is no longer the dominant standalone, head and shoulders above the other uh, countries. One piece of good news, and I think this came from RISI, R-I-S-I, um, 
This is the cost of liner board. Uh, in blue is uh, each one of those little uh, which one of those little graphs is is is, is a mill. Uh, you can see on the blue on the left is Asian liner board. European is purple in the middle, and North American liner board is there. That shows that the U.S. is competitive. The key is what percentile. Uh, those fourth percentiles over on the right, those are the mills that companies will look at either shifting to different products or closing down entirely. But the point is, is with all of these other uh, uh, developments in the rest of the world, we are competitive, and the goal is to keep it, keep it that way. Now, how does the U.S. pulp and paper industry compare with other pulp and, pulp and paper training in other parts of the world? Well, the growing trend has been for a long time for hourly operator workers outside the U.S. to have the equivalent of a two-year associate degree, and that is a global standard. When you look at the uh, technical uh, university, not universities, the technical colleges in, in Finland, in Europe, um, they, they would be, I don't want to say exactly, but they're roughly the equivalent of what our community colleges would be. We find these technical, uh, these technical colleges uh, preparing young people to go into this industry. And even when they do that, and after they join the companies, the companies put them through their own in-house in -house training, both what's happening and why things are happening. Uh, few of today's new hires and incumbent hourly workers have education beyond high school, and they've done, they've done studies, and these numbers are going to change, of course, with, with each company, but it's, it's again and again you hear the number about three-fourths to 80% of our, of our operators have high school degrees, but very few have any, any education and training past that. Um, that's why I think the community college, I've taught the university level my whole career and taught in a lot of mills, but I think the community colleges really hold the key here to uh, working with companies. But that has lagged in the U.S. so far. All right, so how do we compare with other industries in the U.S.? Well, the challenge with the, for the paper industry is that it is not an industry that young people wake up in the morning thinking, I want to go to work in the pulp and paper industry. They think about other programs, uh, anything with the word bio in it, or anything dealing with electronics. There are, there are programs that are very attractive to the young people, and, and it, takes, it takes an effort to, to bring in to programs uh, at the community college level, those young people who will then go on to the to uh, the work in the mills. However, uh, working with the companies, those programs are in existence. There are some excellent working relationships between the community college, some community colleges, and and the companies. So we do have in the U.S. a variety of infrastructural elements. Uh, one of the biggest, obviously, are corporate in-house programs. And I'm, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of these are what I'll call traditional. Some do include this educational uh, knowledge of why things happen as well. And a company does not do the educational part just, um, just cavalierishly because the mindset of the operators is they want to know exactly how this applies to them. And there tends to be less desire to know uh, what's what's causing the problems, what's causing the variations, to try to understand the why things happen. So there's a psychology in how companies have to, have to uh, uh, create this atmosphere. Some have done it. Some have done a fantastic job of doing it. So we have pulp and paper universities. We have community colleges. We have many more community colleges without paper programs but who are working with companies. This, um, this national network, NPT Squared, that was created with, a, with a, the largest grant of, of funds ever given for pulp and paper educational development in the history of pulp and paper education, and that came from the National Science Foundation. 
they, they saw the need to invest in, in this particular area, and as a result, some really cool things that were created. We, of course, have TAPI short courses, seminars, uh, but as Mill just told me, they will send, um, they will send uh, professionals, people with, um, who are salaried to conferences, but they can't afford to send 20 operators. They can't afford to send any operators to be away from the mill for too long a period. So there, there's a challenge there for the companies to try to, try to do this. Um, there have been various attempts at industry learning consortia. Uh, none of those have been that um, um, uh, successful. But let me go back to the top. The second one that's up there are the supplier and vendor programs, and these are outstanding because I've seen some of them, some of my best slides have come from, uh, from the suppliers, and they are very good at, at sneaking in, if you will, but including why things happen in addition to what happens. So between corporate in-house programs, supplier and vendor programs, I think that that's kind of where we are. The emphasis is on what, not as much on why. And there truly is a need for the why, as the rest of the world has, has decided long ago. But that's up to each company. All right, so how do you deliver all this stuff? Well, I think everyone that's tuning in here, that's listening, already knows the answer to this. You can have human interactive learning on-site, tailored, general, off-site, uh, real-time distance learning, uh, but where, whatever, whatever method the operators are getting the information, there's a human being exchanging and answering questions back and forth. And uh, I think when uh, e-learning, DVDs, CDs came out, data was shown that uh, human interactive is not that efficient. The retention isn't there. Well, obviously, I'm, 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 I'm subjectively prejudiced against that. I think human beings talking to each other is the best way, best way to communicate information. So I don't believe in doing all the, doing all the training uh, by access where people do it on their own, self-guided learning. Self-guided learning uh, has been with us for a number of years now. I've seen some excellent simulators, tailored content, expensive to produce. That's, that's always been a challenge for the companies. Uh, E-distance learning, using CDs, videotape, DVDs, the web, uh, and then blends of all of the above. Blends of all of the above. Again, there's no, there's no surprise here, but I do know for, there are some mills who have, and some of you may be in this category, you're, you're newer in, in, in looking at this whole picture and trying to put it together. So hopefully some of this will provide uh, a background. But as I also said, we've got some uh, experienced uh, uh, trainers and, and, and human resource people here as well. All right. So this, these are things that were reported at that conference. There's nothing new here. Um, the big thing is companies are not sure about what will meet the needs. Uh, how, how much money do we have to spend? How much time do we have to invest in training and education? That's a key question. Uh, it, it's a no-brainer to know you've got to do on the job. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer to know that you have to do uh, the traditional type of training, how to operate that equipment the way it's supposed to be operated. But once you start going beyond that, that's where the question comes in in the U.S. as to how much of that is needed. Uh, but that's why I've commented the rest of the world has answered that, and they look at two years beyond high school. The other, the other challenge has been when you work with any kind of uh, educational-type training, how do you tailor it to specific mill processes? All mills have at one time or another acquired a CD or a DVD or have had presentations given which are intended to be general. They have to be that way. How do and does a mill tailor these things to their own equipment, to their own products? It, it turns out there are a variety of ways to do that. 
some less expensive, some more expensive. So there are options there. Um, but you have to have something to build around, in, in my opinion, as a teacher. So you, you want to have the general information because the people who put that together are experts in those fields. But then you need that second component of how to tailor this information to what is done at the mills. Uh, and all has to be done at an acceptable cost. But you have to, you can't do it once. I've taught so many short courses where I, it was great, came in, and I knew the mill did absolutely nothing afterwards. They, they did what they did and they stopped. And you can't do that. Uh, and that has to be an internal function uh, for the mill to keep up with this learning process. But what's the ROI? That has always been the 900-pound gorilla question. What is the proof that investing in these added levels of education uh, provides some ROI? Well, Yako Pori, and this goes back about, oh, I think to 2004 or so. So this is getting close to 10 years ago. They did a fairly sophisticated study of hundreds and hundreds of mills. And they did find some variation in profit between pulp and paper mills making the same product. So they had to be careful. If you took all mills, for example, making liner board, whether they were old or new, they, they saw that there are variations in profit that could be then correlated with what they end up calling human performance. And that included the skills and knowledge. They made a point of saying it's more than just the skills, but also the work environment and motivation. Um, I can give you one example, one mill, where the, that human performance uh, was a complete surprise to me. Uh, this goes back a, about five or six years, but I've never forgotten it. Going through a mill, um, an operator was showing me their uh, ink flotation, a de-inking system, it's a recycled mill, and they were showing me a brand new flotation system. And in the discussion, he said, I am really excited I came up with a suggestion how to improve the efficiency of this unit. And as a result of that, the comp company's profitability this month is going to be higher. And I, I, <laughs> I just I stopped and said, wait a minute, this is an hourly operator talking to me about how pleased he was to have increased company profitability. And I said, I, I, I said, oh, this this is an interesting model here because I had never heard never heard an operator talk like that before. So this human performance uh, aspect of it is something that Yako Pori has has worked on. Um, they believe that training and learning leads to uh, competence. It also helps provide leadership and motivation. The, the key is it's the operators taking on some of the responsibilities and knowledge that has been historically in the U.S. has laid with our technical process engineers. Uh, that seems to be the end result of, of, of this, this effort. And again, this, this is from a Yako Pori study. And I think I've got one more. Um, this was showing that in terms of human performance, uh, this, this resulted in uh, ROCE on the uh, y-axis uh, to show in comparing uh, that return for different countries. The U.S. compared to Europe, Scandinavia, the Far East, and this global benchmark. Now, that's an artificial thing. That global benchmark is that two years of... Uh, uh, of training, and plus a lot of other things. So that's a benchmark number. But those others do show where the U.S. is compared to other countries. And Yako Pori's conclusion was human performance is part of the missing U.S. Um, equation here. So I think that is, is important because it helps justify 
limit the use of limited resources to not only train but to educate this workforce. So we're looking to try to increase the first of all the manpower to hire replacements for those who are retiring uh, and that all these community college pulp and paper programs at best is only going to fill 10 percent of the need so the mills and the industry have to be looking at a variety of options for uh, bringing up to speed if you will and increasing profitability and competitiveness by making sure we have educated operators. So use the hiring of new replacement hourly workers as an opportunity. Try to trans start to transform today's workforce as soon as possible to try to raise it to that new global standard level, which is the equivalent of uh, two years uh, past high school. All right, so I mentioned this uh, National Science Foundation grant, and um, this was uh, created about, oh, seven years ago, I guess. They received the first amount of funding from the National Science Foundation. And as an educator who's been in pulp and paper education, if you count my students' pulp and paper days since the 1960s, this was unheard of. Uh, the amount of money that NSF was willing to spend to create a national network. And uh, what has come out of it are some, some interesting tools which may, may be of value. But it certainly, um, it certainly was an exciting time to see what could be done and possibly has created um, a vehicle, a vehicle that can be one of the many ways that companies can use to move forward. Uh, if, 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 they, uh, if they think it's, uh, it's going to be a value. So, okay, here's what has been done over the last three years or so uh, with that funding. Uh, the decision was made to move forward with e-learning. Uh, and so what you see on the screen in front of you are the courses, e-learning courses that were developed on paper, pulp mill operations, paper, wet end chemistry, coating, chemical recovery, environmental control, tissue manufacturing, and then some uh, e-learning pulping and paper testing laboratories. Uh, got some really cool videos of people doing the experiments, and there's background provided on all of them. Uh, what the test is about, why, does it, why do we get the results that we do, what are some of the variables. And even with the grant ending, uh, we are now looking at uh, other courses that are under development, one on recycling, and then two on paper machine optimization. That's an intermediate level program. Most of these others are introductory moving into intermediate. But clearly, there's an intermediate one uh, with that optimization series. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now, um, is show you to demonstrate the technology. Because as a faculty member, um, this, this is some really cool stuff. And it's technology. Things are able to be done today that weren't available five, six, seven years ago to create these kinds of, uh, these kinds of educational uh, materials. So I'm going to turn this now back to Elise and uh, have her flip up one lecture uh, from the series. The one I'm, I'm picking is wet end chemistry because nothing strikes more fear into the hearts of everyone than the topic of wet end chemistry. It's probably one of the toughest ones to deal with. So we'll just show you some aspects of it and I'll make some quick comments. And the point is to try to demonstrate, try to demonstrate the technology. So in a way, I've got, I've got my sales hat on here because this is just exciting. What you're looking at is lecture 13, uh, how retention aids work. Uh, the, the instructor for this, this whole course uh, is M uh, Marty Hubie. He's a professor at North Carolina State. And uh, the fear, of course, is, well, now we've got an academic talking about all that chemistry. Well, Marty uh, 
worked for International Paper and was their chief wit and chemist. He taught operators. He went into the mills and put on training programs for operators. He does that today. He teaches short courses for undergrads, graduates. He does distance. So he was able to translate this stuff into languages that people can understand. Um, if we now, if Elise would just click on some of the some of the visuals below there, uh, pick it, pick. We'll look. We'll look at two or three. Um, Elise, you can do that. If you have control uh, of this, you can just click on any particular lecture, and not just do them in. Yeah, that's good. I, whatever. Let's see what that one is. Review of mechanism of retention. Now, if you're looking at this, one thing that comes to mind is look at the high definition. All the slides are like that because each slide, if you look right at the very bottom, you can see it's being streamed. The, the, uh, all, all the horsepower of bandwidth is going into providing the best looking visuals. And when you look back on the left, and we can have at least go to a, go to a different one, you can pick and choose the ones you want. Uh, that I like. I really, I really think that's cool. Because some companies have said, we, we've had companies looking at this, they've said, all right, um, you know, we like these, um, these 50 lectures, but there are 30 lectures here that are just not, not important to us. I've never seen, at least at the university, and many of you no doubt have seen, the ability to pick and choose whatever, whatever uh, slides you want covered to kind of help tailor things just a bit. But um, again, what this is intending to show is to give you an idea of the technology of the lectures uh, and, and what they're about. And they, all the others pretty much follow the same, the same pattern. Um, so we'll, we'll close that out because I just wanted to put a mental image in there. And if you go to that uh, website, that link, what that does is enable you to look at uh, uh, almost all the courses. You won't see the new ones, but there are excerpts in there about pretty much all the courses and what's in them to, to take a look at the technology. So, okay, let's keep going. So, uh, we used experts. Uh, there was no time, and it's too expensive to have people create visuals. Uh, those of you in the companies who have had educational materials developed, you know how the costs just get, get they're, they're substantial. So the only people that did any of these were those who have already given these presentations to uh, classes or in industry seminars. They had the material, and all they needed to do was tweak it. And so the development costs for anyone were not as high as you might normally expect them to be. And that's why the costs are able to be kept low. The big thing, too, is in red that they can be revised. Uh, what, what was exciting for me as a teacher, if I decided, uh, or Marty or any of them, decided they didn't like a particular uh, slide, they can delete it from the presentation. They can change the slide, keeping their voice. They can keep their voice or just change the slide or they can add new slides. And there is uh, the, the intent is to update the lectures. So you don't have to redo the whole thing. You can change out new versions of it as, as you go along. And that has not been possible with DVDs, CDs, and other fixed live presentations. So this is, this is really neat stuff. Um, and if I sound excited about it, I am because of what its capability is. All right, let's see what's next. Uh, can be customized. Mills can have study groups. All you've got to do is videotape them digitally, and you can insert them anywhere you want. Or you can get fancier and actually create some in-mill uh, recordings. Whatever the mill decides to do, uh, my feeling is the best effect with operators is going to be to blend these, these educational uh, lectures with information, with visual and voice about what really happens in the mill. And whatever is done, remember Walt Disney was a, was a genius. You've got to have good visuals because operators will relate to them. 
So the customizable thing, I think, is an important element that mills need to do. Um, so I think I already covered that. The mills have various options to, um, to, to do this stuff. And what's nice about our industry, uh, I, I think you all know it, un unlike my, my daughter who's a lawyer and who starts a clock ticking every time she, she talks to anyone, uh, any educator, I, all of us are happy to talk to companies about any of these things without, without you know, costs. Uh, this is important for the industry. And your problem is getting us to keep quiet and get off the line because you've got other things to do. So certainly uh, I'm happy to be able to uh, give information and, uh, uh, as, as best we can. Now, one thing that the National Science Foundation really wanted to, to have, as did Alabama Southern. Alabama Southern was the lead institution in receiving the grant funds. But those funds were distributed to other community colleges as well. But, but the, the idea was to, to put together a, a conference and workshop that would um, be of value to, to, and because of the nature of what was going to be covered. Uh, there will be a presentation on, on the technologically advanced workforce by uh, Larry Montague of TAPI to talk about uh, how to customize talk about a variety of learning management systems, to talk about what's done in different parts of the world. And that's going to be in, um, on July 18th in, in Thomasville, Alabama. And, and I think at that point in time, um, that's when we'd spend more time talking about these different courses. And uh, I think it's an international conference because we have someone coming up from South America to uh, participate in this. Um, that's, that's the uh, form uh, that you would fill out for registration. Everything's free. National Science Foundation will, uh, uh, there's no registration, and they'll, they'll feed us, which is, which is really nice. This is important to, to the NSF. So here's our, this is our overall goal. It's to raise that knowledge and skill, but even beyond the technology, there are these other areas as well. Uh, we're going to be looking certainly at pulp and paper processes, the technology involved, but the mills already have some mechanical programs in there, safety, maintenance, uh, basic skills and knowledge, problem solving, troubleshooting, Kepner Trigo, et cetera. Uh, it's the whole package to get these operators the ability to run these mills. So, okay. Um, that pretty much finishes what I had to say. Are there questions uh, that you would like to ask? I see there are some uh, that have been answered that are in the chat room. Um, hey, Mike, can I throw out one question here? Please go ahead. Anyone that would like to, uh, at least will need to decide to open things up or however, however it's done. I think she may give me the questions, but this is Dick Kendall. Please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. And the, the question I have, just to clarify what you just went through, wonderful presentation on these courses and modules and so on. Uh, just to share mechanically, and some of this may sh be shared at Thomasville, Alabama, but Mills can then decide if they've got three people in this department and four in that department, and they want them to watch a module 36 and 42 and so forth. How do they how do they make that happen, and what kind of costs are involved, or how does that work mechanically? Is that a short answer or too long an answer? Well, when have you ever heard an academic professor give a short <laughs> answer to anything? But I'll try. Um, because of the technology where they can click, just as Elise did on, on, you saw that on slide 13, then she went to slide 20 something, companies can determine uh, which, uh, which slides provide the content they want for different groups. They can either watch the whole thing or they can, they can select the ones they want. What they can't do is just stream in, uh, is just, stream in uh, just those lectures. Uh, they do have to acquire the entire course, and then they can dismantle it and, 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 and decide how they want to put it together. And right now, I think, I think the college has decided on a leasing arrangement uh, per year, unlimited use, but at that site. 
uh, and um, uh, the they, they they don't want to sell these. If they turn them over, they they lose control. Companies w- may or may not update the information and keep it keep it absolutely up to date with the best they can. Whereas if you if you lease it, they'll be making updates and changes all along. So that's a long winded answer, but the uh, you can't acquire seven lectures. You have to get the entire course, but then you can cherry pick the ones that you want people to watch. Got it. Thanks, Mike. Okay, what else? Um, Mike, we're getting in a couple questions here. Um, one question was, is this program easy to customize? Say, could you repeat that, please? Is the program easy to customize? The, the question was, is it easy to customize? And, right. and as, with, uh, as with most things, the, the answer is, this drives you nuts. It depends. It's easy to compromise if you, it's easy to customize if the method that, and low cost if you decide to have whatever sessions you're going to have with operators. Maybe a group, maybe one, two, or three. And you have a digital camera recording it all. And then you might need to work with just a local, you know, a local person to be sure that it's edited properly, so you, you don't have all the, you know, the walking around, and just insert that where you want it, uh, in between the various lectures or in between the different courses. Uh, that's that's quick and dirty. It can be very effective, and that's the easiest way to do it. The however, the other method would be more costly. But it would be more um, formal. You could have someone at that mill, a process engineer, a uh, uh, supervisory operator, be filmed, have someone with that camera out there, where they're out there talking to the variety of audience, just as these lectures do, but they're talking about here with these refiners, or here with this calendar, or with j- this chip feeder, this. These are the variables that are important for us at this mill. Well, that's more involved. There's a higher cost, but you've got a higher quality result. So there are a variety of different ways to do it, but anything is better than not doing it. That's the key. And I don't know, Mike, if you can see that I'm um, flagging some questions for you that have come in. You can see those questions. Well, let's see. I see... uh, Pop, pop, pop. Uh, when will cycling lectures be available? Two thirds of them have already been done. The last ones are being done um, today, as a matter of fact, today and tomorrow. And then there's a ton of editing that goes in <clears throat> to be sure that everything comes together, um, because the voice and pictures are separate, uh, just like in the movies where they record things on two different tracks and then they put them together uh, so they can be translatable. But my guess is the recycling lectures will probably be available shortly after, uh, let's say this summer. I think they'll be available, my, I hope, would be August 1st, worst case, mid-August. And will we demo more of the modules of, at the workshop? Oh, yeah, that's, that's one of the feature uh, items, just so people can ask questions and make comments um, about what's been done. Mm-hmm. Um, before we... Move over to uh, Dick's presentation. See if we have any more questions. I just wanted to let everybody know that this webinar, since it was recorded, it will be available on the PPMA website uh, uh, by the end of the week. So, just letting you all know. If there are any more questions? We'll go ahead and turn it over to Dick Kendall. That's great. Thanks, Elise, and thank you, Mike Kasurik. Great. Uh, you know, when I hear Mike's enthusiasm. Um, you know, it just uh, it's exuded by his comments and by uh, his intonation in his voice, and that's great. Uh, I think the rest of us can capitalize with that same kind of enthusiasm. If you want to learn more, know more, uh, and you want to get to Thomasville, that's terrific. We're thinking of having even a follow-up to when that takes place in July, 
uh, perhaps another follow-up uh, webinar sponsored and hosted by PPMA in conjunction with Mike and NPT2 and so forth. Uh, so that will be determined a bit later on. I just want to endorse some of what you've heard today. Quite obviously, the what people do and the why they're doing it, uh, those of us in human resources call that employee engagement. And it's so important for people to really uh, be engaged and not leave their brains at the door. These modules are a terrific resource uh, that can be used by so many companies uh, when you begin to investigate this kind of thing more thoroughly. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Elise, for queuing this up. Uh, as far as the screen you've got before you right now, I just wanted to make a little uh, commercial here for the Pulp and Paper Manufacturers Association uh, having a first annual Best Place to Work Award. You can find out more about that. Your organizations can get a lot of value out of people getting pumped up. You don't have to be a member of PPMA in order to participate. Uh, I know in my previous uh, uh, career in, in um, the corporate world as opposed to trade association management, well, we had some wonderful opportunities for our employees to really get engaged in this kind of thing and use these instruments to motivate their, their workforce. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, as far as contacting, uh, this slide's got Mike Kosurek's, uh connecting information there as well as Martha Wynn. Uh, she is the individual that will be uh, coordinating some things at Alabama Southern. And uh, my information is there for anybody who wants to know a little bit more about how to access this webinar later on or if you've got other questions about the Pelt and Paper Manufacturers Association. Uh, all of this is pointing to, and I think, do we have one more slide here yet? Yeah, asking you to, to consider getting to Thomasville if you can on July 18th. It would be great. You can find out even more about this. But otherwise, we'll probably uh, just land on the last, uh, on the second to last slide, so that you've got the information in front of you for Mike and uh, for his associate at Alabama Southern and my own contact information. Thank you all for participating. It would be rude of me not to ask Mike if you've got any final comments, and uh, Elise, same for you. Anything else to uh, explore today? Mike, since we have a, a couple more minutes left, there was one other question that came in that I just sent to you. Are you seeing it, Mike? Came in. There, there you we go. go. I don't see it. Oh. Can you can you uh, just the question, the question says any idea of the development cost for a single paper machine? No, because I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, I'm not sure what's what's meant by that. It, it, it's the scope of what's meant to put together a brand new program uh, focused on one paper machine, not using what's been done and then just customizing it and filling in. Um, I I don't think I can give that. I I think that would be something if someone would contact me, I can give a range because it depends on what's being done. If you wanted to recreate that entire course, that, that one that was there on, um, on uh, pulp and paper making, uh, my guess is that whole thing is something, gonna, something around fifty to seventy thousand dollars to do that, which is not expensive in one sense. But I, I don't like giving numbers out because I don't know what the uh, person asking the question envisions. So that individual could, could contact you, Mike, and then you could have yeah. some one-on-one -on -one yeah. dialogue about that. Yeah, because it could be much less if you're just, again, going to customize things where you just uh, uh, have small group discussions and you record them and insert that in there along with a little blend of having someone at the mill, a supervisor, or tech, you know, let, let the mill manager get out there and let him point out a piece of equipment and how it operates. Uh, that's that's lower cost. That wouldn't cost anything like the number I gave. Uh, this is only if you wanted to create from ground zero a whole new course, all new content. That's uh, hey, Mike, those. That's it. My uh, my question for you just before we leave is: Your contact information has your uh, your email address. Do you want to make your phone number available, or do you want to withhold that? <laughs> 
No, that's okay. Uh, we do have we do have a contact number. It's the uh, official Alabama Southern number. It's eight four three four five six three six nine eight. So eight four three four five six three six nine eight. And if you go onto the NPT two Alabama Southern website, that's got all that stuff in there. You can actually look at uh, excerpts of all the courses. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Elise, thank you. Mike Kasurik, thank you. And for everybody who's still tuned in out there, thanks a lot for participating in this website hosted by the Pulp and Paper Manufacturers Association and TAPI. It's been a great morning, and uh, we'll hear from you if in, you're inclined to get hold of us by way of email or telephone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye now. Thank you. Please stand by.